know that we are, um, you and I, we are terminally ill. Uh, you might not like to hear that news, but uh, so how's that for starting off a message? You are going to die. No. Uh, we don't like to admit it. We'd like to reserve that thinking to like, you know, hospitals, funeral homes, and those people that are dying with, you know, the C word, cancer. But uh, we don't want to. We don't want to accept that for for ourselves. I mean, especially if we're under fifty. That that number is changing for me regularly. It's getting a little closer and closer. Many are searching for the cure for sickness, and death. Fountain of youth, a drug that'll stop the aging process, something you can rub on your face and who knows where they got it from, but if it'll take away the wrinkles, okay. If you looked at where some of those cosmetics come from, it would freak you out. Someone showed up with a bag of it on your door, you would definitely not buy it. Oh, we will just take it. If you can eat this vegetable or eliminate this from your diet, you'll last longer. Most of it, really, to be honest, you're just delaying the inevitable. I know we're going to get to some good stuff, but let's just be honest with ourselves. We're not getting younger. Healing. Now that's a subject of great interest. It's also a subject of great controversy. There has been in the church healers. Let me tell you today, there can be a healing today, not because we're having revival services or an amazing preacher that flies a jet, but we can have a healing today because there's a God who heals. That's just it. And for every person that cries out to you and, and, and seeks you, God, you're a God who hears their prayers. Not only do you hear them, you care. We serve a God who is a great physician. How many have gone to a physician? I got a word for you today. There is no wait times in your great physician's waiting room. You go to him, you call him up, he hears you then. Have you ever had to wait? No offense to physicians, I've done some waiting. Yeah, that's right. That's why they call us patients. I get it, I understand. And you know what? You have one of those moments where you're there and you have a physician that takes a lot of time with you. Well, if he takes a lot of time with you, he's probably taking a lot of time with the person that was there before you. But our Heavenly Father is a great physician. The name that we're looking at, we're doing the names of God, and uh, we've done, he is the, the one who is everlasting, the one who is above all time. We've done, he is the Lord, our victory, our, our banner. We're looking at today, he is Rapha. Now that just has some Rapha. It just has some grit to it, doesn't it? He's our healer. Now something about Rapha, it's not just healer, there's a, a reference to it that means he's our restorer. That's very important because it means he's putting things back to the way they're supposed to be, restoring them back to their original state. There's a couple times it's used. I mean, there's like 60 times it's used in the Old Testament. One is very interesting. I'll give you one from a guy named Elijah and one from Elisha. One from a guy named Elijah is very interesting because he, Rapha, the altar. He restored the altar. Another time it's used in Elisha. Elisha put salt in water and it was restored. Rapha. The word has interesting connotations for us today, especially in the context of healing. Here's what it means. When it says, God, you are restorer, it says this. God, you are the one who is the physician, not only the creator, but you're the one who can now put things back to the way they're supposed to be. They're made to be. He can cure, he can repair. I don't know what you're going through. If it's a relationship, it's a, if it's a severed relationship with a family member, or a marriage, or a body, or your soul, or your spirit, or a broken dream, he is a God who is a repairer. 
a restorer. We use the word healing, and we, we only associate it to something in our body. But he is so much of a healer. He puts some of who he is as a creator in what he created, in his image. He is someone who is a restorer. So when the restorer created your body, he created it with restoring capacity. That's amazing. And today, he can restore you physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Let me speak to this a little bit before we get to our text as well. David, he's very good at describing what's going on. He's very good at communicating these struggles. And he talks about this in Psalm chapter 6. In fact, most of the Psalms, he talks about some of his struggles and his pains. But these one, he grabs a few things. Number one, he talks about his emotional pain. Be merciful to me, God. I am, I am faint. He talks about broken hearts and, and emotional hurts. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Whatever pain you're carrying that's not seen, and it might not be able to be covered with a Band-Aid, but it is something that is real and raw. He's a God who can heal that. Even when you're so weary, you're faint. Oh God, heal me. My bones are in agony. Have you ever had sore bones? Some of you might be experiencing a tough time right now physically. Think back at a time when you were physically so burdened that it wore you out mentally and emotionally. We're so connected. Weariness. If you're being attacked physically, and sometimes it's just an ailment, a reoccurring flu or a cold that just keeps nagging you, and it steals and it robs you of sleep, it robs you of joy, it robs you of function, you are being hindered. He's a God who can restore you back to unhindered living. There's all kinds of examples of this in Scripture, the physical, and I'm not going to dwell too much on it because there's so much of it. Hezekiah is a perfect example. He was sick. He asked for an extended of his life. He's about to die. God extended his years. Jesus did so many healings. It's the spiritual one as well that David talks about. My soul is in anguish, he says. This is the most important one. We all have been infected with a disease. It's destructive. It is death. And we are in desperate need of a new heart. So if you're here and you're dealing with some frailty, I don't know if it's, if it's just some mental weariness, some emotional pain, some physical, the spiritual if you added up all the pain in this room, and this is not meant to be a dark but heavy, it's just a real, if you added it up, it, it would just be overwhelming. It truly would be. It would be too much. All I can say to that is, here, in this place, with us today, in fact, the more broken and beat up you are, the closer the Bible says he is to you at that moment, there is a healer, a restorer, who can put things back right the way they're supposed to be. That brings us to Exodus 15. That's the intro. It's where he's first called Rapha. Now, I could have gone to so many texts about healer. Of course I could. There's so many healings registered in the Bible. But this one, this is the one that's very interesting for a number of reasons I'll get to in a moment. But God's people has just come out of Egypt. Exodus 15 starts with a song. You maybe remember this song. Those that have been in the Pentecost church for a while, you'll, remember, you'll start reading this, you'll start humming the tune in your head. I will sing unto the Lord, for he is triumph gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. Right? It was the big round. Oh my God, my strength. Remember that? We used to the back and forth and back and forth. They started uh, this singing in Exodus 15, but... But before we get to that, I, I feel like I need to set up the context just a little bit for us, and then we'll, we'll actually spend a, a little bit of time in the Exodus 15 and draw some principles before we're done. But let's remember where they are. They were in Egypt. They were under oppression, all of God's people, by a guy named Pharaoh and all his armies. And they were made to be slaves. Miserable environment. They had lots of tears, and they cried out to God to deliver them. God answered their prayer. 
You remember the story, I'm gonna do it real quick, but in case you just uh, need a refresher, God sent someone named Moses. Moses, armed with a staff and dependence on God, in obedience to God and whatever he said, God brought plagues on those people to convince Pharaoh to let those people go. After a number of these plagues, and he would say, okay, nope, okay, nope, okay, nope. Finally, he said, okay, you guys get out of here. I'm sick and tired of these plagues. And he lets them go. But one more time, as they're exiting and on their way, Pharaoh changes his mind again rounds up the armies and they go after the people of Israel and now they find themselves trapped between two mountains between the Red Sea and an army that's chasing them behind them what do they do in that situation they have just been delivered from Egypt they get to a place it says in Exodus 14 11 to 15 they said to Moses were there no graves in Egypt you've taken us away to die in the wilderness Why have you dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is it not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Well, now there's a good one there. That might be just someone, you just write that one down. You're in the middle of a pinch, hemmed in on all sides. It's time to cry out to God. It's a time to be still. But also there is a time to move on. At the end of this service, we're going to give you a time and an opportunity to come forward for prayer. And you might be carrying a burden for a long time. You may have talked and complained about it to people. You may have complained about it to family members. You may have complained about it to God. But you may need to just today, and I know it's just moving from where you are to here, but maybe you just need to move. Enough complaining, enough, enough prayers that are really only just problem sharing, and just come to God and say, it's time to move forward. Maybe it's from here that God's going to do work in your life and say, now it's the time to move on into the future and stop dwelling in the past. I'm not sure, but it is definitely a time to be still before God and talk to God, whatever that concern is. But when God says it's time to move, it's time to move. Now Moses didn't know what God was going to do, but he knew that God was going to do something. God performed a miracle. And as a result, people put their trust in him. We know that story, and this really isn't our text, but it gets us there. And it it establishes a really important pattern. Here they are, two mountains, the enemy chasing them. They've got the Red Sea ahead of them. What's Moses do? Stretches out, bang, water gets parted, dry ground. Israel goes across, God's people goes across on dry ground. What's happened, though, is the armies, they come booting across, and the army tries to use the dry ground prepared by God for his people. Sometimes the enemy tries to use God's provisions for his people against God's people. But, but God raises up a standard. As they're chasing, here's God's people. They've made it to the other side. They look back to see the army coming. Oh, great. Not only did we get a, we got a cross, but now the enemy's getting a cross. And then it says, God collapsed the waters on the pursuers and the oppressors are swallowed up in the sea. When the Israelites saw the mighty hand, it says in verse 31, of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, their servant. This is important for just some pattern. Look at here. They were a desperate place. God raised them up to be able to lead them out. As soon as they let them out, a little bit of problem. They turn on Moses. Then there's a miracle. Now they're in favor of God. Good job, God. Good job, Moses. And then what are they going to do? Well, what they're going to do, they're going to have a worship service like we just had. God, you move. You've, I've seen you do it. You've done amazing things. And that is Exodus 15. 
They celebrated. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider thrown into the sea. They give all the details so they can sing this song over and over again and tell generations after generations. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Verse 11, who is like you, Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness? Fearful in praises, doing wonders. And then here's Olam, the forever. The Lord reigns forever and ever. God, you are everlasting. They have a praise and worship service. Sitting there amazed, their trust in God is at an all-time high. We do need to tell the stories. But see, this is where things take a turn. When I say that, I think of, uh, is it Mater off of... uh, of uh, cars, you know. Do not eat the pistachio ice cream. <laughs> the, um, it has turned, you know. The, everything went, went, went wrong. They have seen God provide miracle, miraculously their deliverance. And three days went by as they were going through the desert of Shur, Three days, no water. And you can imagine things started grumbling, they started complaining, uh, they're rationing, they're out, they're, they're weary. And with three days of no water, just three days, but they find water. They finally find water. And they take a taste. I wonder how many tasted it. I thought of doing an illustration today and putting some vinegar in some water and some... They tasted it, and it was bitter water. Bitter. You know, there's nothing worse. I mean, when you're really thirsty, it's almost better to stay thirsty to take a big drink of bitter water, and then you can't get that taste out of your mouth. The place was called Mara Bitterness. I remember on a missions trip, we were going to Africa, and we, we, did a mission, we did an orientation with the missions trip and telling everybody and what the do's and don'ts and, you know, about uh, wear some long sleeves, no so hot, some light shirts, and to prevent from malaria, mosquitoes, and you had to get all your shots before you went and all this, all this stuff. And we were learning some language things to say and say hello, hello and, you know, jumbo, jumbo sana, and habariako, and... So we're trying to learn all these things. And one of the things we taught was do not drink the water. Do not drink water. When you're on these, if, even if you're in a restaurant, wherever you are, do not drink water. You'll pay for it. Now we even take, you know, you take some Imodium, some things just in case, but you do not want to drink water. So we got through most of the trip. You know, I mean, I have never drank when I've been on missions. I drink the most warm soda you've ever seen because if one of it's good if it's capped and it's sealed it's usually pretty good even if it's warm it tastes better than the results of bad water and when we're out there everywhere you go and and you have to be even careful if they boil it you need to boil that water for a long time well you know what happened one of our team members were just finishing our trip we're at the airport, our flights got delayed, it's longer and longer. They decide to go, one of the individuals goes to the local little coffee shop store or restaurant, they wanna order something, they're thirsty, it's really hot in this airport, it's like in the hundreds and there's no air conditioning. And they get a soda with ice cubes. Where do you think they make ice cubes from? Yep, water. I was like, what are you, you got ice cubes, yeah? You didn't say we couldn't have ice cubes. I'm like, oh my. <laughs> I'll just say this. We gave them an aisle seat. <laughs> it was not good. It was not good, bad water. Water is life. It's hard for us to understand that in in North America. We have so much fresh water around us. Water is life. You know, there's an ancient weapon called well poisoning. It was used defensively as well as offensively. Well poisoning. 
know what they would do? If there was a well, if you were in retreating and you didn't, you didn't want the enemy to slow down in their pursuit of you, you would poison wells. Or if you wanted to make your enemy weak, you would get behind into enemy lines and you would poison their wells. You know how you poison a well? They would take a rotting dead carcass and they would throw it in the well. That's what they would do. I know it sounds extreme, but it makes sense, doesn't it? And you can't reverse that. You throw that dead body in that well and it spoils that well. It snuffs out life. Let me say this, church. Has somebody thrown something dead in your life? Some kind of word spoken, and it's rotten in there. It's turning things bitter. I don't know what it was or what was said or what was done, but the enemy still throws rottenness into what's alive and sources of life that causes then bitterness to seep. You've seen it. I've seen it. Well poisoning. People of God entered into a place called the desert of Shur. Shur means wall. They ran into a wall of despair again. One minute it was a wall of water. God delivered them and now they hit another wall and they have no water. Three days, David Wilkerson said, they descended from the heights of praise to the depths of despair. Some of you may have hit a wall, had high expectations, now great disappointments and extreme discouragement. What did they do? What should they have done? Well, they protested. Gratitude turns to griping when the memory of God's faithfulness is somehow forgotten. They forgot in three days. Three days. They went from giving praise to grumbling protesters. Makes me think of even Jesus on his way into Jerusalem. Hosanna, 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 and then crucify him, crucify him. They came angry with God, but they took it out on a person. Came to Moses and said, Moses, what are we to drink? One person said this, anger is a magnet in search of a metal. When someone is angry, they're just looking for someone to throw it at. It's, it's, it's a magnet that's just looking for a target. We tend to take things out on others when we don't get what we want or when we want it. Think of what they witnessed. All the plagues they've seen, God's delivering them out of Egypt. Think of the... the the amazing feat of, of walking across the Red Sea and then to see the sea swallow up their pursuers. But instead of trust, it was griping, complaining. It was as though God couldn't make the water pure. As though God had led them somewhere the wrong direction. It's like somehow they expected better. What did they expect? Did they expect that everything would be just perfect and peachy keen? I mean, we all want the promised land, but we don't, we want the, the flowing with milk and honey, but we won't want stinky cows and stinging bees. You follow with me with that one. You can't get flowing milk without stinky cows. You can't get the sweetness of honey without those stinging bees. What did they expect? They went from total faith to extreme doubt. Why do they, and why do we, think that we have to get ugly with God or with others to get what we want? I don't know why that is. Maybe you have another why question. Why did God allow them to come to a place of no water? Why did God lead them into a desert? Well, let me answer that question with Deuteronomy chapter 8. God speaks it very specifically. He says, He humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The reason why sometimes God allows us and leads us into lack and the desperate situations is so that we know that we 
absolutely need him and to follow him at all costs. Gratitude turns to griping when the memory of God's faithfulness is forgotten. His word is our life. We must follow him. We must keep his word and take him at his word. Praying. Moses leads well in this moment. When we're in impossible situations, we need to pray. Moses cried out to the Lord. Look how fast this happened. He cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Now that piece of wood, I believe, either one or two, is either there all along and he didn't see it, or God just put it there all of a sudden. Now either way is a miraculous, and I've kind of experienced both in my life at different times. Where sometimes there's something I didn't even know and it just shows up. There's other times there's things that are provisions from God and they're right there, but my my whooped up of worry has, has blinded me from seeing it. Some of you, God might just need to do a miracle of opening your eyes to see what's right there. But it's not just the wood itself that's miraculous. It's, it's his being obedient to what God wants him to do. It says he prayed and talked to God, and when he said amen, he opens up, he sees a piece of wood, he picks up the piece of wood, and he chucks it in the water. And it made the water pure. Now, how do they know that? I'm not sure if it was visible, if somehow it went green and then it went pristine. I would like to know the courageous soul that took the first drink. Instead of protesting, Moses prayed. And here is the first reference to God being Rapha. Yes. The reference not relating to him healing a body, but restoring bitter water back to pure water. Isn't that interesting? We serve a God who is a restorer. I'm not sure what's got you poisoned. I'm not sure if you've got a little bitterness there. What death has robbed you, I don't know. But if you need a restoration, I know a Rafa. If you need a restoration, I know a Rafa. If you've had someone say something to you, I know a Rafa. If you need a miracle, I know a restorer. If you're in the middle of a storm, I know someone who can make it calm. If you are in the middle of a situation where you've been blamed, I know a Rafa. If you're blaming someone, I know a restorer. If you need wisdom, I know a Rafa. If you need healing, I know a restorer. Don't gripe, don't protest, don't blame, don't doubt. Just call out to God and be obedient. That's what Moses did. He talked to the Rafa the one who can restore. What is that? It's bitter water? Just a minute. Let me talk to the restorer. He talked to the restorer. What should I do, God? Take that wood. Throw it in there. Okay, there you go. Restored. What's next? When you share your need, in a few moments you come forward, you're just simply saying this. I have something that needs to be restored. In the middle of their bitterness and hurt, God reveals himself as a healer. There's a real important if here. Two letters that makes a big difference. If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees. There's a promise here. Very big condition. It faced three days of no water as a test time for him to reveal himself as a God who restores. If they never experienced bitter water, they wouldn't know God can make things pure. If they never tasted death, they wouldn't know what life was. Let me give you a few principles from here and from scripture on healing. I felt like I couldn't escape this and then we're going to close in the time of you bringing what needs to be restored to God. Number one, some principles regarding healing. Life's problems can get us back on track with God. Talked to someone this week and they said, you know, I went through a big of a struggle, but I've never been so close to God and some times in the word that he just spoke to them. And, 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 and I've experienced that at times. Listen to what the psalmist said. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. 
But now I obey your word. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I could learn your decrees. Has anybody ever experienced that? I have, man, I have. I have. I have. There's times I've gone through some challenges and some dark valleys. And those are the times I can remember being closest to God. It brought me closer. When we were hurting, we must run to Jeho- Jehovah Rapha. Resist the temptation to fill that emptiness with things that don't satisfy. Sometimes our problems are related to personal sin. Now before you run out of here, let me finish these thoughts. But to not make this point would be to make a great mistake. When you're hurting physically, emotionally, when you're experiencing pain, it is good to take inventory. Because sometimes what you're experiencing are the side effects of sin. I know that's not a popular thing to say. David links this emotional agony to sin. When I kept silent, he said, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night. Your hand was heavy. He's talking about conviction. Your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped like in the heat of summer. He continues in in chapter 38 of Psalm. Because of your wrath, there's no health in my body. My bones have no soundness because of my sin. For I'm about to fall and my pain is ever with me. I confess my sin. I'm troubled by my sin. Personal sin may be a contributing factor to your pain or your illness. Enough that it should be taken seriously. Now, thank you for not running out and saying this guy's preaching heresy because I think some people have preached only that and haven't put it in context. Here's the other part. It is wrong to link every problem to personal sin. That's the mistake Job's friends, comforters, made. When he was going through affliction and losing everything, they came along to comfort him by accusing him of wrongdoing. Have you ever had one of those friends? Have you ever thought that maybe you're just, you know, it's something you've done? Well, thanks, bud. Now, let's be careful here. Yes, sometimes we can be experiencing affliction and pain and adverse circumstances and situations because of sin and things that we've done ourselves. But we also need to admit, oftentimes we can beat ourselves up so much we're self-fulfilling prophecies. We condemn ourselves, and the condemn leaves us burdened. Condemnation leaves us burdened. Now, but I'll speak to not only you speaking to yourselves, you need to stop that, but also some of you need to back off. When you come across people who are going through a difficult time and giving them your perspective on why they're suffering. Jesus addressed this when his own disciples saw a blind person and said, Jesus, who sinned? him or his parents. What's interesting there is they automatically assumed it has something to do with one of those sinned. There's no other option. It just must be either he sinned or his parents. Who sinned? And in a way, Jesus told him to back off. Neither. This happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. Not everybody's healed. There's a guy named Trophimus. Trophimus in 2 Timothy, it says he was gone on a missions trip with Paul and he got so sick that Paul had to leave him back in Miletus. There's Timothy. It says in 1 Timothy 5, 23, he had constant stomach and it says literally frequent illness. God pres- prescribed through Paul a little bit of wine for his stomach, for his stomach and his frequent illness. I'll just say this, not everybody's healed. Not only that, if their healing or their afflictions was because of sin, from what I know about Paul, he doesn't pull punches. If he thought it was sin, he'd have nailed it. But he didn't, because it wasn't related to sin. Going to professionals is good, but whatever you do, do not forget to go to Rapha, the great physician. There's a good balance here. God often works through doctors or or trained professionals or medicine 
or instruments. Bitter waters at Marah became better. Why? Because God just said, pure. No. He used an instrument. As crazy as it is, a piece of wood thrown into it. Sometimes God uses instruments. He could say the word like he did to the winds and the waves and make them calm, but sometimes he uses instruments. And I absolutely believe, and I know some instruments of God who are physicians that God uses to instrument healing in people's lives. I know it. Institutions he's used. Sometimes God uses instruments. Having said that, what Asa did in the Old Testament is a good warning in 2 Chronicles 16. It says, Through his, though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from physicians. You can read that one up later, but listen to the warning. I'm just saying this. Don't bypass the great physician on your way to the doctor's office. See, Asa, he sought only professional and not God as well. We need the community of faith. James chapter 4, this is what we're going to do in a few moments. It says, if anybody's sick, let him come. Ask for the elders, people to come and pray. Second, confess your sins to one another. And third, pray for each other. This is only possible if you're in a community of faith. This is why we're not meant to live alone. We're not meant to follow God alone. I want to read this for you. It's a very powerful story called Comforters, adapted from a woman, Linda Richardson's writing. She said, when I was diagnosed with a deadly disease, my one friend came and expressed shock by saying, I can't believe you're sick. I always thought you were so active and healthy. He left. I felt alienated and somehow different. Second friend came and brought me information about different treatments and gave me his opinion about what to do. He left and I felt scared and confused. Third friend came and answered, tried to answer my whys and told me God may be disciplining me for some sin in my life. She left and I felt guilty. Fourth friend came and told me that if my faith was greater, God would heal me. Left, I felt like my faith must be inadequate. Fifth friend came and told me to remember that all things work together for good. Then left and I felt angry. Sixth friend came. Actually, now that I think of it, sixth friend didn't come at all. I felt sad and alone. Seventh friend came and held my hand and said, I care, I'm here. I want to help you through this. When she left, I felt loved. I knew everything was going to be okay. We need one another. It's time to stop pretending. It's time to reach out. Ask for help and help. Faith is a force in healing. Some people mistake and think that you've got to have perfect faith in order to have perfect healing. Others think that the healing doesn't happen today. It was only for a long time ago. Like somehow it was needed then and it's not needed now. As long as we're on this side of heaven, we need healing. Here is the biblical perspective on faith, I believe. You pray earnestly for God to do a miracle. Have faith that he can and cares. But be careful about demanding that he does do what you want him to do. We pray his will, not our will. Someone, I've been in desperate situations. People, would you pray for healing? Yeah, I'll pray for healing because I'm told to pray for healing. I believe God can heal right now. Miraculously, and we've seen it. I was talking just this week over, my wife and I were meeting with a couple. We're talking about how God healed their son. I've seen God do that and he will do it and he'll do it again. I know he will. But there are many times I pray for him to heal and he doesn't. I've prayed for him to heal in my own life and people I care about. And he hasn't. Not the way I want him to. Does that stop me from praying? Absolutely not. I pray. I trust. I pray his will, not mine. Joni Erickson Tata, a woman, is a, 
had an accident when she was a young woman, but served God faithfully all her life. God certainly can, she says, and sometimes does heal people in miraculous ways. But the Bible does not teach that he will always heal those who come to him in faith. So that is my context. Let me move forward. The Bible's very clear, though. In James chapter 4, you do not have because you don't ask God. And in fact, what's a very strong message about faith is when Jesus is ministering in Mark 6, and he's trying to work in an area, and it's very difficult for Jesus to work in an area and bring about healing. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. I'm not saying it has to be perfect faith. But we cannot absent our faith. We must hold on to our faith. That God can heal. He could heal today. Some of you might say, I've prayed for this all kinds of times. What's the difference going to be today? You need to come forward. If you come forward today for prayer, come forward believing that God can. Not the pastor who's going to pray for you, and if this person does it or that certain way, don't put your faith in anything else today but one thing, your faith in God. Because God responds to faith in him. And there was a lack of faith that prevented Jesus from doing healings. Don't put your faith In anything else today, put your faith in him as you bring him your need to restore. Sometimes healing takes place in unusual ways. This is a whole study in all itself. You can do a whole series on this. I've given you a bunch of texts. You can read them all. But I mean, there is a... God did a miracle through through a stick in Moses' hand. God is... a, A guy dipped seven times in a river and he was healed. Jesus put mud in a guy's eye and he was healed you think that's bad he put his fingers in a guy's ear and healed him another one he spit and put it on a guy's tongue so he could start speaking Uh uh-huh yeah that's the guy he put his fingers in his ears here do you think that guy cared about coronavirus oh I'm a little bit careful here today. Some of you are going to be going, oh boy, where is the hand sanitizer? (laughs) Here's another one. The lepers. Ten lepers. They can't be around anybody. They've been the way they are for a long time and their condition's getting worse every day. And here they are, and just because someone says, you're healed, where you go? They look, nothing's different. But it says, as they start walking to be declared clean, even though they don't look clean, as they're walking, they became clean as they were going. How's that one for faith? That's another weird way. Doesn't touch them. Doesn't spit on them. Just tells them, where you go? One comes back and says, thank you. Paul, they, they put anointing on a cloth took the cloth, brought to someone, and they were healed. It's amazing. What I'm saying is this. Don't copy any one of those things. God does amazing things in some extremely unusual ways. So don't limit what God's doing in your life from the way he's done it or because it might be a little bit different. And don't limit what God wants to do through you either that way. God might want you just to write a note, might want to make a call, might want you to just do something that might seem a little... There's people I know that have been healed when they were praying for someone else to be healed. I've seen someone healed by someone pointing at somebody. I know someone who was healed when they were sleeping. He does things in different ways. He heals differently. Let me read you a story from Tony Campola who was wrapping this thing on and down. Tony Campola was speaker, was speaking in a church and was asked at the end of the service as he's talking about how amazing God is to pray for a man who had cancer. It was advanced. He boldly prayed for this man's healing. And the next week he got a telephone call from the man's wife. You prayed for my son, my, my husband, he had cancer. 
When Capolo heard the past tense, he thought he was going to hear this story of God's faithfulness to heal. And she said, he died. Campolo felt terrible. He was lost for words. Don't feel bad, she said. When you prayed for him, he was filled with anger. He was filled with hatred. He was, he was in a difficult, dark place. He was 58 years old, and he wanted to see his children grow up and his grandchildren. He was angry that God did not take the sickness away and heal him. He would lie in bed and literally curse God and anybody that came close to him or talked about God. His anger grew and grew. And the more miserable he was, the more miserable he made people around him. It was an awful thing to be in his presence. We came to church that day desperate. After you prayed for him, a peace came over him. A joy came into him. Tony, the last three days, she said, have been the best days of our lives. We sung, we laughed, we read scripture, we prayed, we visited. There have been just wonderful days. I will treasure these last three days. Thank you, thank you, thank you for praying for my husband. He wasn't cured, but he was healed. You might think your affliction is something that can be tested in a tube. But there might be a whole complete different work that God's wanting to do on your life, a restoration today. The cross of Christ is a source of healing. I couldn't miss this one. It may be a little bit of a leap, but I don't think it is. Notice the significance of a wood product being thrown into something that's impure to make it right. And I can't help but miss the correlation to the New Testament of Christ being nailed to a tree. All of our problems began at a tree in the Garden of Eden. And God has restored things by another tree. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. He bore our sins on that tree Only Jesus can sweeten the bitterness of life. Okay, so back to Exodus 15, and we're going to lock it up. The only way to go from Mara, bitterness, to Elam, is to turn to Rapha. Verse 27, they came to Elam after this whole thing, and the bitter water is made pure, they have a good drink. They walk seven miles, and they get to a place that's got... 12 springs and 70 palm trees. And they camp there near the water. Yeah, no guff. I think this is a good place. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Let's stay here a while. It's like an oasis. Now, some number of people, I think it's kind of neat. I mean, there are 12 tribes of Israel. There's 12 springs. There are 70 elders. There's 70 palm trees. But what what really shocks me in all of this is it's about seven miles down the road. Here they are having a pity party and a blame fest, and they're only seven miles away from provision. How many of us are on a path being led by God, and we are almost there, but we're losing it. And we've, we've locked ourselves up, and we are right there. We are almost at the provision, but we can't see it for the bitterness and the death. Our wells have been poisoned. Maybe you've fallen recently, maybe you've struggled, maybe you've crashed, maybe you're hurting emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically. But your oasis is just around the corner. If anyone is thirsty, let him come and drink. And of the worship team come. Your oasis might be right around the corner. He can restore you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. If you're going through a tough time, there's nothing like, when you're afflicted, afflicted in our bodies, there is, there is something happens that can affect our, even our spiritual vitality, our joy. You need to ask. If you're here and you've got an affliction and you need your body restored, you need to ask the restorer to restore your body. 
Maybe you're suffering, I put these together, but a mental, emotional, what is not seen, personal pain, a devastation, a relational rupture. Relational ruptures can cause great mental and emotional pain that take time to heal. The people at Mara were complaining, were questioning, were doubting, were struggling, were worrying, were blaming, were bringing one another down. They were defeated. Maybe something was said when you were younger, maybe something was said yesterday by a stranger or someone close. But you need to cry out to him and ask him to restore your heart, your mind, your emotions. I, 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 I'm going to move on, but I've got to go back. Some of you, the way you've dealt with your emotional pain is you've, you just flipped the breaker. But God didn't create you to not feel. You were created with emotions to be emotional. But you haven't been able to for a long time. You've thrown the breaker on the whole building. And it's robbing you of legitimate, meaningful relationships and connecting with people on an emotional level that, that is robbery. I know, it's tough. You put that breaker back on again and you'll find out where the shorts are. God wants to restore you emotionally so you don't have to live by shutting down emotionally so you can connect with the people you need to connect. That is for someone here today. I know it as sure as I'm alive. If that is you, you need to today to come. God can restore you and heal you spiritually. Would you stand with me?